The Refugee Ministry at Westminster Church started in 2011 when we welcomed our first refugee family. We sponsored a Burmese family uh, who arrived in March of 2011. And uh, that family is still part of our church. They're members. Um, they've done very, very well in America and um, become citizens. They own their own home. They have good jobs and they've made a great adjustment. The fact that they did so well um, really encouraged us to try to minister to more people. And over the years, we've had a significant growth in our ministry. And since about 2014, we've ministered to Congolese families. And we have a very large group of Congolese families that are part of our ministry now. I came to this country in 1987 from Kenya. And I came as a student at Lancaster Bible College. And when I landed there, a friend of mine led me to Westminster Church. And uh, since 1987, I became a member of this church. At the time, I was alone, but my wife and children came two years later. I'm now a ruling elder in this church, and I have been in this church now for 34 years. We love it, my wife and I. Our children have grown in this church. They were married in this church, and therefore this is home for us. Fortunately, as a Kenyan, Swahili is part of our language, my, is my official language back home. So they invited me to this ministry. And from that time we decided, hey, let's start Swahili service. The Swahili started with around 2017 with just a few number of Congolese. Now we are talking about 120, 130 times. Sometimes we have got 150 members in this church. Our Congolese worship service is an amazing experience to come into from a cultural point of view. Um, our worship tends to be very formal at Westminster and the worship is very vibrant and very dynamic. And there's a lot of dancing, there's a lot of singing, there's a lot of clapping, there's a lot of involvement that people have kind of with their whole bodies involved in the worship and it's a wonderful thing to experience. <laughs> The core of our ministry here really involves English language skills, trying to help people to learn English and to become acclimated to the culture by learning English, learning to read English, learning to speak English. And then we have a number of ministries where we, we just we do different things for people to sort of help them, whatever their situation is, help them to acclimate to America and help them to understand how to live in an American culture. Our tutoring ministry meets once a week and the students are picked up by volunteers in the church uh, after school and they come here to the church and they are assigned almost a one-on-one -on -one tutoring situation and they tutor from 4 till 5.15. We give them a snack before we start tutoring because they've had a long day at school and they're hungry. And some of them participate in choirs and then afterwards they participate in the clubs and the groups here at the church. So. Um, we really wanted to enfold them more into the activities of the church. I've been working with a 15-year-old who really, um, he needs a lot of re remedial help. He's just not where he ought to be given the conditions of coming out of a refugee camp in Congo. I asked him if there was things that he wanted me to pray about for him and he said, I don't want to think about those things. And I think there's, there were some very difficult situations that many of the refugees faced when they were back in their home countries. Uh, rebels fighting and tribes against, the, you know, just horrendous kinds of things that children should never witness or know about. So yeah, so I've been very careful not to tread on those parts of his life. I think he wants to move forward and away from that. These people, they are escaping because of war. Congo, historically, has been known a country that has been in turmoil for many years. There has been a very severe war going on within that country. You hear the stories of these people running away from their home, walking for three months in search of refugee camp. It has not been easy. Stories that really can move you. Children die on the way. They dig. They bury them, they will leave them, then they walk on. 
There are some people who have been in refugee for 25 years. Ninety-two times in the Old Testament, he says, you are to love the stranger. Ninety-two times. There's very few things that he says 92 times to his uh, people. And God, when he encourages us, I truly believe, is not just encouraging us because this is a nice thing to do. He has a plan, not just for that stranger, but for us. And if we are to grow in our faith, we have to get out of our comfort zone. It's that way with loving the stranger. It may not be the most comfortable thing that we do, but it's what God uses to turn us into the people he calls us to be. And that those are turning points in our life before him. I think it's easy um, with all the wealth and privilege that we have in this country to think that we have a lot to offer um, to foreigners and sojourners in our country. And we do, that's, that's true. But we've got nothing on them when it comes to faith. These followers of Jesus that are coming, their faith has been tested to the brink. Um, they have endured so many hard things and they come out on the other side and they still claim him and they are teaching him to their children. I think for us, we've just been very, very blessed in getting to know refugees that have been in our home and, and learning their stories of faith and seeing the way that God is working through them. The reason uh, we think a choir is important is because music is such an essential part of their culture. I heard someone say that music is really kind of in their DNA, and it's just part of their joyful expression. It's um, a huge part of the way they express their faith. I think that um, children are remarkably resilient, and um, singing is a way for them to um, process through some of the, the trauma that they've experienced. Uh, there's a lot of really high mountains that they have to climb. And if choir can just be an opportunity for them to um, have that creative expression and, and praise to our Heavenly Father, then I think that's a wonderful experience for them. Our desire is that we all worship the same God. You know, what does Ephesians talk about? We have one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. And that's our desire. Now, we know that there are, are challenges practically of how to, to do that in a worship service, but we never want those practical challenges to get in the way of the fact that there are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so uh, we want to worship with them when we can. We want them to be a part of the life of our church. We hope that the first generation feels welcomed, cared for, heard. Uh, we learn from them as well. We hope that the second generation really grows up as part of our church so that the DNA of our church will be represented by folks who've come from all over the world and are able to worship together. I think the church in America has an amazing opportunity as God brings the nations into our communities. Many of these people coming to America come from a Christian background and that's why they fled their country because they were being persecuted. Um, and many of the people who don't have a Christian background are very open to the gospel because they're in a new culture. And so I think there's an openness now and there's an opportunity that's unprecedented. Personally, for me, it has opened my heart up to the, the needs in the world. I would say that I probably was a very local Christian in my, in my view. When first started in the church, I'm sure that there were plenty of people in the church, including myself, who went, wow, this is inconvenient, really. And, you know, then getting involved and, and getting to know the, the students and getting to know the parents, um, it's not an inconvenience. It's, it's a need and it's something that we're called to do um, by God. And so it has given me a great love for the people who have come here.